Christmas time, the holidays. Is this the way they end for me here in this place, a mental hospital, they call it? <laughs> That's a fancy name, that is, but I know a better. The bug house, a place where they lock you up and then throw away the key. And now they've got me, too. Me, Fred Clanton. Fred Clanton, Fred Clanton, is that really my name? Oh, everything's so mixed up. These grounds, these buildings, they're all so dark. Everything's dark, even the sky. I'll never get out. That George, he's turned them all against me. Even Betty. They keep talking about me. Why won't they let me alone? Oh, my God. Oh, no, don't let them take me in there. I'll never get out. Oh, God, what will happen to me now? What will happen to Fred now? What happens to all of them? The men and women from every walk of life who each year pass through doors like this into the mental hospitals of our land. Here, in the story of Fred Clanton and the typical Oklahoma State Hospital to which he came, the spotlight focuses on these people. Many patients are old, and often theirs is a tragedy of hospitals such as this. The tragedy of fathers and mothers too old to work, rejected by their own children classed to senile and committed to mental hospitals because there's nowhere else for them to go. Yet, given proper care, they can still adjust, make new friends to ease the passing of years. Some patients are disturbed, unable to care for themselves in normal life situations. Others are physically as well as mentally ill. Many are capable of limited adjustment, able to work at varied tasks within the hospital. There's the veteran returned from years of service overseas. The farmer who had never set foot outside his home county till he came here. Deterioration, chronic conditions, limit hope for some. Others may go home tomorrow. Meanwhile, they're living here. 3,200 men and women all gathered together in a modern mental institution, a city in itself, complete with every facility for effective treatment. Though shortages in hospital personnel do exist, patients are secure and comfortable, and most of them are happy. For while mere custodial care can never be enough, a favorable environment and human comforts are essential in any therapeutic system. For most, meals are served cafeteria style. Food is plentiful and good, an investment in patient health. Just baking the bread for 3,000 people is a man-sized job. Above all, though, these kitchen chores offer patients work the therapy of busy hands. The laundry, more chances for patients to focus on specific realities outside themselves. First step along the road that leads to recovery and release. The patients tell you the power plant smokestack is 525 feet tall. They seem to take a personal pride in it, maybe because power is so important here. The sick must have heat and light. There's water to be pumped and food cooked and laundry washed. Patients must be housed, and today's new hospital buildings center on human needs and comfort. Whether they provide living quarters or treatment facilities, 
whether they're for convalescents, older people, the tubercular, veterans, or occupational therapy, these modern structures are part of a long-range integrated plan to improve conditions for all who live within these grounds. Special units provide homes for nurses and attendants, for they too play a vital role in helping patients to regain health. In addition to the regular staff, student nurses come here to learn to recognize and care for the mentally ill. There are lakes for fishing. The hospital farm cuts operating costs provides fresh truck and dairy products. And the familiar scenes, the work, help make patients from rural areas feel at home. They come from all sorts of homes, these patients, all kinds of backgrounds. But somewhere along the line, life became too much for them. Some apply for voluntary admission to the hospital. One of the three procedures by which residents may enter a state mental institution in Oklahoma. Many former patients return of their own free will when new troubles assail them. All applicants for voluntary admission are held a minimum of 15 days for examination before they may be released. Other patients are certified for admission by two competent medical examiners. This is the second method by which patients enter the hospital under the terms of Oklahoma's mental health law. The majority, however, come by court order, committed either by a judge or a six-man jury. This was the case with Fred Clanton. Fred Clanton? Oh, yes. How are you, Fred? Well, I'd be all right if they just left me alone. Well, why don't you tell me about it? You can't fool me. I know you're in with them, too. Fred, I'm going to send you to the hospital. And if you will cooperate with those doctors, I think they'll be able to do you some good. The admitting clerk records Fred's case history as soon as he enters the hospital, takes care of valuables until he is sufficiently improved to be trusted with them. Escorted to the receiving ward by an attendant, he's bathed and outfitted. he gets a blood test, part of the medical examination given each patient on admission. There's a chest x-ray also, and a spinal fluid test. Finally comes a neuropsychiatric check, designed to bring out data related to the patient's mental disorder. They're turning my wife, you know, Betty, against me. They're taking up all her time. Why do you think they're doing you this way? Well, I've been working on this for years. They don't know it, but I'm on to them. You see, if they can just get Betty to team up with them, then they'll all try to get together. A clinical psychologist gives Fred a variety of specialized tests in order to make possible a more accurate evaluation of his total personality.
Following the examination and testing, an informal meeting of the hospital staff arrives at a tentative diagnosis of schizophrenia, paranoid type. Fred benefits from the skill and experience of all members of the staff, as well as the psychiatrist to whose care he is assigned. Diagnosis and staff approval completed, the patient is transferred to a treatment ward for therapy. In Fred's case, insulin shock is prescribed, a common treatment for schizophrenia. Electroshock therapy may be recommended for other disorders. Hydrotherapy is useful in calming disturbed patients. So are sedative packs. But whatever the mode of treatment, it's essential that it be supplemented by an atmosphere of security and calm. The effective hospital must always serve as a refuge for its patients, a place where they can live quietly during that period of reorientation in which they learn how to achieve a better adjustment to the world outside. Free of adjustment, the level of orientation varies sharply from patient to patient. Some show a complete loss of contact with reality, dark shadows across disordered minds. In other wards are light and life, a return from private worlds to the here and now. As patients improve, they are moved towards in keeping with their condition. They're given the opportunity for contact with others who are also getting better. Shown that their status as individuals is recognized, that no matter what their problem, there still is hope. In Fred's case, insulin therapy brought relatively quick improvement Close linked with it, helping further, was personal follow-up attention by the psychiatrist directing his treatment and care. Occupational therapy reinforced shock treatment, helped Fred to draw away from his feelings of antagonism and suspicion and move closer to reality. Boredom is always an enemy of the mentally ill. Now improving, Fred begins to take increasing interest in the wide variety of recreational facilities. Patients enjoy movies just as much as anyone. And a hot game of dominoes or pool or ping pong is always fun. The sewing room's popular. And a permanent wave may serve as a milestone of self-respect for many women, in spite of the bubble gum. Books mean so much to so many. Improvement brings added privileges, a more normal life. What could be better than an afternoon softball game? Friday dances give Fred a chance for contact with women on a social plane, help to spark his dormant pride.
Religious services in the chapel offer inspiration. Then there's the happy day when Fred is granted grounds privileges. Fine, Doctor. As a matter of fact, I feel like going back to work. Well, uh, you have to stay around the hospital for a few days. Maybe we can find you something to do here. Oh. How would you like to help us out around the hospital here? I don't know whether there's much I can do or not. We have quite a few jobs that uh, you could, might do. Mm -hmm. For example, you might uh, work up the dairy, you might help out in the garden, or you might uh, work over in the cafeteria, or we might even be able to get you on the ground crew. Ground crew? Yes, sir. I like that a lot. I really would. Oh, well, that's swell. You just report out there in the morning and everything will be all right. In the morning? Yes, sir. What a difference it makes. At last, Fred can be outside once more, working, enjoying the sun and the seasons. There are the days when visitors come, the chance to talk again with Betty, and George comes too. And now, somehow, he doesn't seem quite as bad as he did before. It's not too long till the psychiatrist decides that Fred can try it for a while at home. He talks with Betty and with George, helps them to understand that they too have vital roles to play in aiding Fred to adjust successfully to the world outside. Then the words pass to the switchboard to call Fred in. How well he looks. A cigarette from the doctor. And Fred's hand is steady. Packing at last. A man can be proud of the things he's created with his own two hands. And a hospital can be proud too. Proud to see a patient face the world as a man again. So this is it. Today I'm going home. Six months it's taken. If I'd come here sooner, I might have been out in three. But all I could think about was fear, the way everyone was all against me. How much I hated George. How wrong I was. Or no, not wrong, sick. And now that I'm well again, I can't help feeling just a little sad. The way you always do when you leave a place where you've lived, learned, and grown. But I am well, and I know it. I'm able to face the world again, my own hometown. <laughs> I suppose there'll be some folks who'll stare and talk and sneer. But no matter what they say or do, one thing I know, these people here, this place and time have given my life back to me. <laughs>